Hey guys, it's Belle, and in this video I'm going to be reading through and translating a rather interesting piece, which is the verse prologue to the Old Saxon Haleon poem. Now, I am going to, in the future, be doing videos on my channel, reading through the entirety of the Gospel Harmony poem, which is called The Haleon by Modern Scholars. This is a poem that was written in the Old Saxon language, and it synthesizes all of the Gospels of the Bible into an easily accessible verse poem which sort of merges the aesthetics of Latin Christianity with Germanic paganism. And what's interesting about it is what, of course, the Old Saxon language is written in, but then also how it's framed by the Latin language prologues in both verse and prose which precede it. Now, there are two different kinds of prologues here. The prose one mentions uh, the royalty of the Old Saxony area more, it's much more terrestrial, whereas this focuses on the almost mythological figure of the poet who allegedly created the Old Saxon Heliand, and it presents a very standard sort of almost rags to riches story of this person just being a humble poor farmer who happens to have an amazing skill for poetry given to him from a divine source. And a sort of very obvious influence for this kind of notion of a, a sort of relatively humble person being given the gift of song by a divine source is clearly found in Cadman's story from Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People. And we do know that um, Bede's texts, at least some of them in the form of his homilies, were circulating not only in um, early medieval Saxony, but also they were circulating specifically among the kinds of preachers who were using vernacular Old Saxon texts to preach to the laity, as we can see from the fact that there is a Old Saxon fragment of a homily written by Bede. So, Clearly they have access to Bede's texts and they're using them to inform the Old Saxon literary texts that are being produced. And this is no exception with the heavy influence, forgive the noise in the background, from the Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History and Cadman's story specifically. And if you want a full breakdown of Cadman's story in the Old English version of Bede's text, I highly recommend checking out my video on that um, Cadman's story in Old English. Now, Without further ado, um, I will read through this poem from start to finish, bear it, have some patience, it's quite long, and then we will break it down line by line. And as usual, forgive me if my Latin diction is not the best. So, Fortunam sedioque viri latesque labores, carmine privatum delectat prome revitam, qui durum impresso terram vertebrat artro, intentus modico et victim, Tum quervebat in agro. Contentus casa la fuera ad cui culme ad esta, potesque e aclive sonni pe sua limina nunquam. Obtrivitatu armenti sua cura su debat, o felis nimio propio qui vivere gensu, prevaluit fomitemque ardentem se extinguere dire. Invidie pacemque animum gestare quietam. Gloria non illum non alta palatia regium. Divitie mundi non dira cuptum devat. Invidiosus erat nul nilec invidus ulli. Seculus latam scindebat vom merdeteram. Spemque suam in modico totam stutuebat agello. Cum sol per quadrum cepiset spartre de mundum, luce sua radios atres gentibus umbris, egerat exiduo paucos venando juvengos, de pellens tecto vasti per pasquo saltus, letus et tatonitus larga pascebat in herba, cumque fati gatus batus tegmine fessa, convictus somno tradis et membra quieto, Mox divina polore sanans vox labitur alto. O quid agis vartes cur cantus tempora perdes, incipe divinas legitarve exordine leges, transferre in propriam clarissima dogmata linquam. 
nec mora post tanti fuelat miracula dicti, qui prius agricola mox et fuid ille poeta, dun cantus nimio vates per fusus amore, metre que post docta dictavit carmina lingua, ceprat a prima nascensis origine mundi, quincre rella bentes per curven sempre secli. Venit ad adventum Christi qui sanguine mundum, faucibus erripuit tetri miseratus averni. Whew. Long poem. Now, let's dive into it. <coughs> Fortunam studiumque viri letos que labores, um, carme privatum delectat promere vitum. So let's just tackle the verbs first. De delectat promere. Um, it delights us, promere, to lay out privatum, um, privatum vitam, the deprived life, and this meaning deprived of vain worldly pleasures. Fortunam, the, the fortune, studiunque, and his endeavouring, his zeal. Let hosque labores, and the happy um, labours, Carmine, in song of a man. So it's delightful to lay out the deprived life, the fortune, the study, and the happy labours of this man in song, Carmine. So this man who, qui dudum impreso terram vertebat aratro. So who for a long time was turning the land, was turning the soil, impreso aratro, with a sort of having pushed plow in, it's difficult to translate something like that directly from Latin into English, but with a pressed plow, we'll say. Intentus modico et victum querebat in agro. So this man was focused, um, querebat, he was seeking victum, his nourishment, modico in agro, in a humble, modest field. Contentus castle afuerat, he was content in his little hut. Very cute. Cui cool me attesta, patesque aclive sonipes, sua limina lunquam obtrivit. Now, um, he was sent in his house, um, that man to whom, or, or, or that man, um, yeah, to whom, um, sonipes, we'll tackle this first because it's not nominative, and this is an interesting little, um, almost a kenning in old English, sorry, uh, in Latin, and it literally means a being whose feet make a lot of noise, and this, of course, refers to a horse going, you know, gallop on the road. Obtrivit means it broke. Um, sua limina, his boundaries, uh, culmea testa, the thatched roofs, potesque acrives, um, and the rising posts. So this is literally referring to the um, structure of his house. So he lived in a house with um, poles and thatched roofs um, and his horse never basically broke the boundaries. So he never travelled on his horse beyond these borders of his farm, presumably. Tantum armentis tua cura studebat. So he was only tantum um, focused on his armentum, which is his pack animals, sua cura studebat. His care was only focused on the pack animals. O felix nimium proprio qui vive recensu. O happy man, qui, who, um, prevaluit vivere, who was able to live um, proprio censu, by your own approval. So, like, you didn't need anybody else's, like, praise or recognition. Fomitemque ardentem, and the burning kindling extingue dire invidiae, and you were able to extinguish the burning flame dire invidiae of dreadful envy. Pacemque animi gestarve quietam, and to exhibit the pe the quiet peace, animi, of your rational mind, because bear in mind, that's the difference between animus, which is the rational mind, and anima, which is the soul, basically. Um, gloria non illum 
non alta palatia regum, vitia mundi non dira cupido moverat. So we'll actually start with um, this here, one here, illum, uh, and then moverat. So something was moving that man, or rather it was not moving that man. So these yellows are all of the things that were not able to move in the sense of persuade him to act in a different manner. So gloria to glory, alta palatia regum, the high palaces of the kings, divitia mundi, the riches of this world, and dira cupido, um, dreadful desire. Now this is a somewhat interesting word, cupido, cupidus, because, or cupido, because it can refer to a desire for, like, say, an excess of food or for money, um, but it can also, and I, I would tentatively say that it more so refers to a sort of sexual desire and sexual appetite. So saying here that dreadful desire doesn't move him, perhaps this is implying that he was asexual or great sexual, or at least certainly was able to control his sexuality, that's one of two different ways that it can be looked at. It can either be looked at as dreadful desire didn't control him or move him in the sense that he wasn't controlled by a sexual desire which was outside of the bounds of acceptable behaviour, or one can say that he just didn't have sexual desire at all. So maybe the poet who supposedly composed the old Saxon Helian is actually asexual? Who knows? That would be fun. Invidiosus erat nulli nec invidus uli. Um, he was jealous of nobody, and um, nor was he envied by anyone. Securus latam shindebat vomre terram. Being secure, securus, latam terram, the wide earth shindebat vomere. He was sort of slicing up, basically, to throw it out. Spemque suam in modico totam stuebat agello. So he was, I, I'm, what I think this means by the fact that he was slicing up his field, vomere, to, th to throw out, the implication being to sort of spew out fruit. So he was cutting up the field with his plough in order to get it to spew out fruits in the form of crops. Spem suam in modico, totum stutue patagello means, and he was setting up, spem suam, all of his hope in modico, agello, in a modest field. Um, and there may be a subtle reference here to the um, psalm number four, which is which has the line, um, singulare ter in spe constituistime, um, O Lord, you alone have set me up in hope, because we've got the words, Hope here, his hope, and the same verb, statuebat, um, he was setting up. And one quick thing to note about some of these lines also, but it's not consistent enough that I would really say that this is a deliberate feature of the poem, is that we sometimes get a bit more alliteration here than I would expect from Latin poetry. So, contentus casula cui culmea, and then we have, for instance, divitie non dira cupidum, um, there's a couple of others here. Securus in debat, spemque suam statuebat. There are some more abbreviations here than you would get in an average Latin poem. And this might be a sort of veiled reference to the style of alliterative verse that we see in the Helian itself. Cum sol per quadrum cepiset spargere mundum. So, when the... Sun, cum sol, per quadrum cepi set spargir de mundum, um, had begun to sprinkle throughout the square world. Now, this is kind of a, a curious one, or throughout the clean square. And this, I imagine, must be the square of his field, right? Luce sua radios. Its rays, luce sua through its light. So when the sun had begun to, gone to sprinkle its rays throughout his square field by its light, atris cedentibus umbris, with the halls falling into shadows. 
Uh, now, bear in mind, this is, of course, the time in which people are going to be retiring for the night. They're going to be lighting up the fires and maybe having some feasts where they would sing songs to each other. The nobles, that is. Egerat exiguo paucos menando juvencos. So, Egerat means he was acting exiguo menando um, in humble, vain glory, basically. Paucos juvencos de pelens, sort of driving away the small youths, uh, tecto from his roof, per pasqua. Uh, vasti saltus means throughout the grazing lands of a vast leap. I'll be honest, I'm not fully certain what this is meant to be, but I think this is essentially saying that he was guarding um, his field um, by driving away the youths um, from keeping watch from his thatched roofs, basically. Letus et atonitus. Larja Pashebat in Herba. He was grazing his animals, presumably happy and atonitus, meaning stupefied, basically, but stupefied in the sense of not being, I guess, too full of himself. It's it's not a negative here, obviously. Um Larja Pashebat in Herba, he was grazing his animals in a broad field or on a lot of grass. Cumque fatigatus partidos sub tegmine fessa. And then, when he was tired, partidos sub tegmine, under the covering of the, or well, under the bro- under a broad covering, presumably this is maybe referring to the roof itself. Convictus somno tradiviset membra quieto. So, being defeated, convictus somno quieto, he um, handed over into a quiet sleep membra fessa, his tired limbs. Marx divina polar resonans vog labitur alto. Soon a divine resonating voice falls alto polo from the high pole. This is from heaven, obviously. And then this is the angel coming down and saying, O quidages vates. What are you doing, O poet? Cur uh, cantus tempora perdis. Why are you wasting time for song when you could be singing? Incipe divinas recitare exordine leges. Um, begin to recite divinas leges, the divine laws, exordine, in order. Presumably this is the Ten Commandments. Transferre in proprium linguam clarissima dogmata. And also, incipe, begin, transferre, to transfer, in propriam linguam, into your own language, clarissima dogmata. So start translating into your own language the clearest dogma. Now, this is where um, the differences between, well, to some extent, between Bede and the Halians' accounts, because in both of these accounts, you have a sort of a secular man who is visited by an angel who gives this person the gift of song and commands them to start singing. But in Bede's poem, the angel just says, sing me what who, like sing me something. Um, and Cadman says he doesn't have the ability to sing, but the angel says, nonetheless, you will. In this case, the angel explicitly tells him to translate the divine laws into his own tongue, into his own language. Now, this, of course, Originally, the Ten Commandments were written down in Hebrew and then translated into Greek with the Septuagint and then into Latin with the Vulgate. And it's the Vulgate version which will have been circulating in 9th century Germany where this story is supposedly set and where the Halion would have been read aloud in the Saxony region. Um, So he's translating this text from Latin into English. Now, this is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because there's... Only one real explanation for this is in that either this is a humbling of a real-life figure who was a monk of some kind, because only a monk in this time period would have had the Latinity necessary to translate the Ten Commandments from Latin into the Old Saxon language. And so this doesn't really match up with the whole story of a humble farmer who lives in the world. So presumably what this is, is um, it could be 
the person who composed the Haliand being a monk, I guess, revising their own backstory to make it seem more humble. Or it could be um, a miraculous thing where this was, in fact, a humble farmer with no education in Latin. But when the angel came down and told him to translate these things from Latin into Old Saxon, suddenly the poet was able to, and then he would start producing this amazing poetry. Um, I lean towards the latter interpretation, but, you know, I should make you aware that there are other possible ways of reading this. No, so, let's go on. Nec morda post tanti fuerat miracula dicti. Um, nec morda is like, basically, no delay, basically. There was no delay. Nor was there a delay post miracula after the miracles tanti dicti of such a of such a saying. So after the angel said this thing, um, there was no delay after these miracles. Qui prius agricola, that man who was previously a farmer, mox et fuit ille poeta. Soon he became a poet as well. Now this is kind of interesting because it, I guess, implies that ordinary people in this time period were not composing poetry, and it also implies that even among the pagan Old Saxons, poetry itself was a skill which people were specifically trained in, and they didn't have ordinary occupations while doing so. Now, this is probably not true. Ordinary people probably did compose poetry, as they do in all kinds of languages and time periods. But perhaps what this implies is that the role of a person who was a vate, who was a poet, now unfortunately we don't know what Old Saxon word this would have been glossing, but um, so we don't, can't necessarily break down what kind of role this Vates would have played in the original society in Old Saxon, in old, the Old Saxony region. But it implies that it's some kind of occupation which is a worthy enough component of a person's life to have a title, right? It's a job that they do, at least in part. So he becomes a poet, he becomes a bard. Uh, perfusus uh, nimio amore, perf you know, suffused with excessive love, cantus of song. Metrica post docta dictavit carmina lingua. Um, after, the ed after these teachings, dictavit, he was reciting metrica carmina, metrical songs, lingua, in his language. Now, this reference to metrica as well is kind of interesting because it normally refers, of course, to Greco-Roman meter, but the use of this word to refer to the Halion, which is coming, which is written in actually not even all that metrical, the, the Halion is often very loose in its rhythm compared to other Old English poems such as Judith or Beowulf. Um, so the use of the word metrica here is a curious one, and it could refer on some level to a kind of awareness by the people who were writing this, the Latinate uh, monk who composed this poem, and a recognition that the old Saxon poetry has as much of a tradition and rules for versification as the Latin language in which this poem is written, which is a very interesting, I guess, recognition of the validity of Old Saxon as a poetic language, not just a sort of language that you use to communicate with people who don't have access to Latin. It's validating the Old Saxon language as a poetic and artistic language in its own right, which is a very interesting sentiment in this poem. So, Ceperat a prima nascensis origine mundi. So, he began a prima origine, from the first origin, nascensis mundi, of the world, of the birthing world, of, of the emerging world. So he started with Genesis. Quinque relabentis per curvens tempora secli. Um, crossing over quinque tempora, the five times, relabentis seculi, sec, seculi of, the for, of the world which is falling again. And this word relabentis is kind of interesting because it could refer to this idea of entering into the last of the ages because 
the word seculum is a very complicated one in Latin, and it can refer to the physical world, as in the earth and the universe. It also refers to time and a period specifically of a thousand years. So ru running through the five um, times, basically the five ages of the world which is falling would imply that they have already gone through five ages. Um, and these are ages which are divided up um, according to different periods in the Bible. So the first is from Adam to Abraham, the second is from, I think, Abraham to David, the other is from maybe David to Solomon, the other one is um, from Solomon until Jesus, the other one is Jesus onwards, and then there's the last age or the the seventh age, because they believe that since the world was created in seven days, it would end after seven ages. And there was debate, particularly in the time of the Venerable Bede, which of course this is written afterwards, as to whether um, humans in Bede's time, so that's the seventh century uh, or eighth century in Northumbria, whether these humans were living in the, I believe in the sixth age or the seventh age. That was a big debate in the time. So this poem actually takes a stance on this. It's saying that the poet was passing over the five ages of the world, venit ad adventum Christi, he came to the birth of Christ, which is in the sixth age, qui sanguine mundum vaucibus, who, um, by his blood, uh, mundum, the world, eripur, he, he took, he snatched back the world, sanguine by his blood, vaucibus, uh, from, from the abysses, tetri miseratus averni. Um, miseratus is like having forgiven tetri averni, the foul underworld, or rather, I should say, having forgiven the world, he saved it from the grips of the foul underworld, tetri averni. So this is the poem introducing the old Saxon verse Haley, and one last quick thing that I would say is that this little note about passing through the different ages, it might indicate that this poem had a monastic audience as well, because making reference to this sort of computistical counting of the ages is the kind of subject that only really monks would have known about, and that ordinary people probably wouldn't have been all that invested in. It's a very scientific thing. So including a reference to this in the prologue to the Heliand suggests that at least in some cases this poem was meant to be read aloud to monks. Quite plausibly it was intended to be read aloud to monks while they were eating their meals because during this time period holy texts, including the lives of saints, would have been read aloud. And I could quite plausibly imagine the old Saxon Heliand being a very appropriate text to read during lunch in a monastery where there are lots of novitiates who don't speak good Latin yet, but still need some sort of theological grounding. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. This is um this has been the Old Saxon verse prologue, giving you a sort of backstory to who supposedly wrote the old Saxon Heliand. Now this is probably fake given how closely it seems to draw from Bede's account of Cadman, but it's nonetheless an interesting story to take a look at. And in another video I will be looking at the prose prologue and then in subsequent videos in later weeks so I'll be going through each chapter of the Heliand and doing a reading translation and hopefully by the end of the whole series I'll have finished reading through every single text in the Old Saxon language in general, of which almost all of that text is the Halion poem itself. So, thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you want me to teach you Latin or any of the other languages that I do on this channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon, which will be in the description of this video, and I offer tuition there at lower than market rates. You can also join my Discord server, where I tend to post these glosses before I turn them into videos, so you'll get early access there. And until next time, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you have a nice day. Bye everyone!